As we read the Old Testament, there are so many minor prophets that are found there, but don't just skip over them. There's some magic inside each one of those accounts. God places his prophets at different times and different seasons when they need to be a voice to the children of Israel. And the same today, we have prophets and we have the word of God that speaks to us in season. One of those prophets is Nehemiah, and he was strategic in rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. An incredible story, but he faced opposition in the task that God had asked him to do. But the result was that something that endured beyond all generations, and we still speak of it today. Second Timothy tells us in chapter three, verse one, but know this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And I don't know whether we are in the last days or not. I've done a whole series on the return and I hope and pray that you look at that and check that out. But it is difficult days, no two ways about that. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, brutal, some people are like that today, despise of good, traitors, headstrong, hoarders, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away, turn away. Difficult days. Now, you know, when Timothy wrote that, Obviously, they were living in difficulty days too. I mean, you think about the days in which they were living, right? But we know it's also difficult for many today, many difficult for families, difficult for business, difficult for church even. But through it all, through it all, can I just say this, that you and I do have a mission. Hallelujah. We have a mission. We have a commission to fill, and that is to co-labor and to build God's house, to build God's house. I often say nobody's got the authority to pull down God's house. We've only got the authority to build God's house. You can always tell, to, tell the, the work of the devil because the devil's out to divide, to destroy. Uh, the devil's out to discourage. That's one of his big tools, right? We're called to encourage one another daily. We're told to build one another. Hallelujah. We're told to be in unity. Amen. And so I don't want to be an instrument of the devil. The Bible even says to pray for those who persecute you do good to those who hate you, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting days in which we live. But, you know, when I think about co-laboring and building God's house, to lend a hand and to put a hand to the plow and to build what Jesus said he would build, and that is his church. And, uh, you know, when I think about Timothy's day, of course, they didn't have the internet, iPhones or Facebook or anything like that, but they had Jesus and we have him today. They have the Holy Spirit and we have the Holy Spirit today. They have the Word of God and we have the Word of God today. And they had each other. Amen. And we need each other today more than ever. But they were a temple being built, hallelujah, out of living stones. Let's read First Peter. Coming to Him, Jesus, that's who we're unifying around. Coming to Jesus as a living stone, rejected indeed by men and chosen by God, precious <laughs> and precious. You also as living stones are being built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, but he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to those who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You know, Jesus also said, Beware when all men speak well of you or when men speak well of you, right? And so he is a stumbling stone. He said, if, know this, he said, if they hate you, that's because they hated me first. So he's the rock of offense. And people take offense of us because we belong to Jesus, right? I'm not trying to be a martyr. I'm just giving you the scripture. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they are also appointed. But you talking to City Impact Church and obviously other Christians around the world today. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praise of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. I was doing a post and I said, you know, my choice was to receive Jesus Christ and everybody chooses either to receive Him or to reject Him. And I spent my life encouraging people to receive Jesus. Amen. And it's a free choice. We can't let that be taken 
taken away from us. Who were once, and it says, who were once not a people, but now you are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. So the church, as I've said it before, is about God and people, not about buildings. Buildings are great to keep us out of the rain, but it's about God and people. The church is about God and His great love reaching out to whosoever will. Whosoever will put up their hand and say, here I am, Lord. Hallelujah. Send me, accept me. You know, if you're willing to open up your heart to Jesus, He accepts you. He takes anybody. He took me. Know this, that His grace is sufficient for you, no matter who you are. Revelation 3, 2, it says, wake up and strengthen that which remains. That's been my verse this year, and I think it's certainly come to pass. Jesus told us over and over again to what? be watchful, to be alert, and to pray, because it is easy to sleep, let's be honest. And my prayer, my heart for you and for City Impact Church and for all churches is to be fully awake, to be a people that are fully awake, a people who are aware of the day in which we live, so we don't miss the day of our visitation. And I've endeavored this year to blow a trumpet, to awaken us all, right? About all kinds of things. Uh, the, the rising of ancient gods, you remember that. And, uh, you know, as part of the fivefold ministries, ministry, if I use that term, to blow the trumpet, to blow the trumpet in Zion, to sound the alarm. And we know for those who've watched the Legacy Project that the trumpets were used for myriad of reasons. Uh, they were called and blown to bring the people together. That's pretty difficult today, apart from being online. They were blown also to set out on a new journey. They were blown also as a warning, a warning that the enemy was coming. Uh, also blown to prepare for war, to prepare for war. Now, the Apostle Paul spoke about it. The trumpet needs to be blown with a clear sound. In other words, to be wake up and to be strengthened. And I think that's been pretty clear. I hope and pray you remember, my friend, what God spoke to Joshua to be strong and very courageous. They say ignorance is bliss. In other words, you know, if you're ignorant of things, you don't get involved in things, maybe it doesn't disturb you. But likewise, you can't pray about things. You can't help people if you're ignorant of their situations. And so we need not be ignorant of what, what's happening in the world right now. In other words, just keeping up to date. We're living in such moving, incredible days, uh, days that I've never experienced before. And so it's good to be aware of what's happening so you can pray correctly, that you can walk rightly and justly before the Lord, and just to help other people make this journey along the way. I was brought up in a good, solid Christian house, good, solid Christian church. Through circumstances of my own doing, I found myself away from God. And I guess my first real encounter with someone who I would consider a real Christian outside of what I'd known was a guy called Darren. And Darren was a kind of guy that would just get down and take an interest in your life. And he just kind of went out of his way at work. He was uh, in a higher position than I was. Um, and he went out of his way to help me. He went out of his way to help me in my work, but also went a little bit of a step further and got interested in my life. And uh, he would invite me out to places and different bits and pieces. And um, along the way, he started sharing why. And it was about the faith that he had in Jesus Christ. And of course, I was in a state where I was always conscious of God, thinking about him, but trying my best to avoid him. But I found myself drawn to this guy because he was genuine and he was genuine in the reason why he wanted to talk to me. And uh, maybe a matter of months that uh, we obviously built a strong friendship, and then I found myself invited to church with him and his family. Unfortunately, it was another couple of years um, before I actually graced the doors of the church, which is now City Impact Church, which I'm thankful for. But, but I guess I wanted to, I guess, share that impact that he had on my life because of the fact that he was just genuinely interested in me. And that was uh, and that made a real impact on my life. For me, not very technical in my thinking, uh, not very academic in my knowledge base. But one thing that I feel empowered by God is is to actually talk to people. That's to me, it comes natural. It's the most simple thing that I know. It's the most natural thing that I know. People normally can read from a mile off if you're trying to push something at them or on them. So I've always found the, the best way to actually build into any given situation, whether a short-term situation or a long-term situation, is simply to find out about a person. 
that's a really, really good first step. Just take an interest in somebody. And you'll find that when you start taking interest in other people, regardless if you call yourself an introvert, an extrovert, or whatever, taking an interest in people will always lend itself for God to use you. And sometimes that is just making conversation. You know what, when I'm going into a conversation, just taking a genuine interest and maybe being the one that actually might open the case for them to start thinking about God. So I guess my encouragement to the person who's nervous is, you know, look for opportunities, because there's opportunities everywhere. And it's not all about the Hollywood ending. Sometimes it's just about planting the thought. And what God does with that thought is incredible. And someone else will come along into that person's life and they'll build on that thought. And all of a sudden, it will really, really put a challenge in there. And I know God can actually work with a thought. If you plant a thought in someone's head, then who knows when that thought's gonna come back. But I know that God is interested in that person's life and I know that God will have his way with that person's life. Let's read Nehemiah 1 verse 3. And they said to me, the survivors who are, this is a report he's getting now, who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray. Lord God of heaven, a great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy to, with those who love you and observe your com commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. That you See, we want God to be awake. We want God to be awake to our prayer, right? And uh, maybe sometimes we're happy to sleep ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about natural sleep. We all need a good night's sleep. I sleep like a baby at night, praise God. I'm not talking about natural sleep. I'm talking about spiritual sleep, being unaware of things. In any case, uh, your, I pray that your eyes are open, Lord, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants. And I'm praying for you too, church. Hallelujah. Verse 11. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants. That's prayer, prayer, prayer. And to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper. People don't like uh, when people prosper, but to prosper this day, I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For he, I was a cups, uh, king's cupbearer. Then the king said to me in chapter two, verse four, and I'm skidding, skipping through some verses. What do you request? So I prayed, he is a man of prayer, to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Verse 10, look at this. When Sambalat the Hornite, what a name, and Tobiah the Amorite official heard it, they were deeply disturbed, deeply disturbed, deeply disturbed that a man came seeking the well-being of the children of Israel. Wow. Isn't it amazing how people become deeply disturbed when they hear of a man or, or people who seek the well-being of the people of God? Wow. Wow. Not everyone is your friend. I just want to tell you that. Not everybody likes what we're doing. And I think you know that. Verse 16. And the officials did not know uh, where I'd gone or what I'd done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build. Come. Now they're building in the natural with, 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 with natural stones. But we are being built today as spiritual stones into a temple. It's exactly the same. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he spoken to me. So they said to me, let us rise up and build. Praise the Lord. Let the, so they set their hands to this good work. It's a good work we do, church. When Sambalat the Hornite, Tybara, the Amorite official, and there's another one, Gisham the Arab, Herbert, three of them, Interesting, isn't it? Three of them, you know, you got the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Here you got three. They laughed at us and despised us. They laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing 
Come on, church, you need to wake up now. You need to wake up and see this. What is this thing you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, his servants will arise and build. Let nothing stop us from doing this, church. Arise and build, but you will have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. And uh, we could talk, go straight to the book of Revelation right there and what happens to those. But in any case, we won't. Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is all about the people working together. Do you know 16 times, 16 times in the New King James, it says next to, next to, next to. In other words, they were next to each other. And then another phrase it uses is after them, after them, after them. And 16 times as well, 16 times next to, 16 times after them. Talk about working in unity, talking about helping one another. There were no gaps. There were no gaps, my friend. You know, we've got to stand together, right? Amazing. You know, because if one falls, we all can fall. Let's read chapter 4, verse 2. And he spoke before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, What are these people, do, Jews, doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Some people call the church rubbish. Stones that are burned. And Tobiah the Amorite was beside him. He said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes on it, he will break down their stone wall. Really, to be honest, people have got no idea of the church around the world, the body of Christ right now. Billions, hallelujah, of Christians. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their heads. Give them a plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Well, Jesus told us to pray for them and he himself on the cross said father forgive them for they know not what they do but here's Nehemiah here's in the Old Testament you know what they did back there you know David and all that kind of stuff but and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you for they have provoked you to anger before the builders so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to its half height for the people had a mind to work now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Amorites, the Ashadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored. You know, when, in other words, churches grow and churches become large, churches begin to flourish, right? When they hear that and the gaps were beginning to close, that they became very angry, right? And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Listen, nothing's new, friend. This is back in Nehemiah's day. It's the same as I said way back, even in the garden, but right throughout the book you'll see. Nith. Nevertheless, we made our prayer, and that's what we need to do, church. We need to be a people of prayer as never before, right? We made our prayer to God because of them. We set a watch against them day and night. Be watchful. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. The strength of the laborers is failing. I know people are tired. I know people are weakened. I know people get their chinks in their armor and they get worn down and they start to listen to this and listen to that. Listen, the strength of the laborers, and there is so much rubbish, so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversary said they will neither know nor see anything till we come into the midst and cause the work to cease. Wow. In verse 14, I love it. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. Fight for the family of God. Fight for the church. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that, they all, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. We all got something to do, friend. We're testimonies written uh, and epistles of God, right? So it was from that time on that half my servants worked at construction while the other half held spears. In other words, you know, you know, they all had their part to play. The shields, the bows, the war armors, the leaders were all behind the house of Judah. Those who built the wall, those who carried burdens, load themselves so that with one hand they worked on construction, but the other held a weapon. Well, think about the, think about the, um, Armor of God, you got the sword of the Spirit in one hand, praise the Lord, you got the shield of faith in the other hand, amen. Every one of his builders had a sword good to decide as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was besides me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and expansive. We've got a great work to do, church, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Let's not become separate. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. The battle's not ours, it's His, amen. So we labored in the work. And I love chapter 5, verse 13. And all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according as they had promised. What kind of promises have you made to the Lord in days gone by? 
We've all heard stories and even seen them in movies where people have made a promise to God for him to get them through this next predicament that they find themselves in. But making promises to God should not be done rashly. You see, God made a promise to you. He made a promise that he would never leave you and that he would never forsake you. He promised that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you will have and do have eternal life. He made another promise that all your sins are forgiven. See, God's word can be relied on, but can yours and mine? Are we people of our word? Do we make rash vows to God or to people? We need our words to be yes and amen. We need to be able to speak truth. And when we've made a mistake or a rash vow, own up to it, speak about it, go to the person and make reconciliation. And above all, apologize. That's all you need to do. How often do we come to God and he has another promise for us? As we ask for forgiveness, he is just and he is able and he will forgive us all of our shortcomings. Chapter 6, verse 1. I just want to read Nehemiah. It's just a great story for today. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Gisham, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors to the gates, that Sambalat and Gisham sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. Ono. Sounds like John Lennon. No, just kidding. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Let's not get distracted from what we do, friend. Why should the work cease, he said, why I leave it and go down to you. So they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. You know, I answer a lot of people and I answer them in the same manner. Then Sambalat sent a servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter, like an open email. Get the picture? They had letters back there. We got emails today in his hand. It is written. It is reported among the nations, and Gisham says that you, the Jews, plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that there, you may be their king. Amazing, eh? They attack always the leaders. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah, and these matters will be reported to the king. So therefore, come, let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. You invent them, people out there, and inventing things in their own heart. For they, they are all trying to make us afraid. They're trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was finished, hallelujah, on the 25th day of Elah in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and the nations around saw us that they became very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. You know, God will get the glory. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. And also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Debar, and the letters to Debar came to them. They also reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. And Tobar, he sent letters to frighten me. You know, in chapter 9, just as I bring this to a close, in chapter 9, they stand up and it says, Stand up and bless the Lord our God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise, for you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, hallelujah, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord our God. And so, friend, can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Can we unite in Jesus? I love how chapter 10 ends up in verse 39. We will not neglect the house of our God. That's one of the, the, my precious verses. We will not neglect that. I've never endeavored. I've never wanted. I will never neglect the house of God. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about what we're building here, going for the souls of men and women, talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Chapter 13 refers to another time when uh, an enemy tried to discourage them and destroy them again. And in verse 2, let me just read that. Uh, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, they hired Balaam. Remember I mentioned another enemy, Balaam, against the curse. Of, however, look at it, however, however, our God turned the curse into a blessing. 
Hallelujah. Come on now. Praise the name of Jesus. Our God turned the curse into a blessing. In the closing chapters, he says, remember me. I'm bringing this to a close. He says in verse 14, Remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God for its services. What a great prayer, particularly for me as I, you know, I'm coming to the end of my journey to some degree. I think it's a wonderful verse, and I know, hallelujah, that I can pray that. And God, you know, we do, God is a rewarder, and uh, there is rewards also in heaven. In closing, God does not forget. God does not forget what you gave, what you've done. What, what God does not forget. He writes it in His books. We talked about it. He, he bottles our tears. We're the ones that are told to remember Him, right? Remember. Remember Him. Remember His death until He comes. So why build? Let me close. Why am I building? <laughs> why am I putting my head above the parapet? Why am I getting, you know, you know, being a, I won't say, you know, getting my head sliced off. Why am I working? Well, first of all, I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for Jesus. I'm doing it for the church. Hallelujah. Because the church is the hope of the world. Don't, I know it's not for the faint-hearted. Let's not be weak Christians. Let's not be faint-hearted Christians. They were told to go home in the day of battle. Let's be strong. Hallelujah. Be strong. Even, I know, as I said, freedom is like a dirty word today, but it shouldn't be. Uh, choice is, should, is not a dirty word today. We need to choose Jesus. Amen. But let me close with Nehemiah verse 31. It's not on the screen, just in my notes, because I love it. For thy great mercy's sake, you did not forsake them. For you are a gracious and a merciful God. And verse 17 says, Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great ki kindness, who forsook them not. To build your life upon the rock, of course, the rock is Jesus Christ. And that's where you can have a firm foundation. You don't get swept away by the storms of life, by what's happening in this crazy world right now. And so when you give your life to Christ, open up your heart by saying a prayer along the lines of, Dear Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me my sin? I thank you, Lord, that you died for me, gave your life for me, and I now give you my life. You know, by saying a prayer like that, you become born again. You begin a wonderful journey with Jesus Christ. Pick up the Bible, God's Word to you and God's Word for you, and begin reading about the great stories like, Nehemiah and Ezra and, and Jeremiah and all these wonderful people in the Bible and find a great church and become part of it. I know that as you walk with God and talk with God, God will impact your life. City Impacts Church Kids is on YouTube. Our channel is fun, exciting, and all about the Bible. It's a safe place for kids to watch challenges, games, songs, lots of funny videos, and search their favorite characters. Search City Impacts Church Kids on YouTube to subscribe and watch.